Welcome to the Three Martini Lunch. Grab a stool next to Greg Corumbus of Radio America and Jim Garrity of National Review. Three Martinis coming up. Hey, it's Friday. Glad you're with us on the Three Martini Lunch. The bad news is we don't have any good news, but we do have uh, three martinis today. Uh, definitely one bad, and I would say two crazies, Jim, but there's certainly some badness in that last one that we're going to be talking about. Brought to you today by the Headspace app. A uh, couple of quick housekeeping items before we get going here. First of all, I was, you know, after all the criticism we've had of the Biden cabinet, I was almost really excited to find out that he nominated Michael Reagan to lead the EPA. I thought that would have been a really nice gesture to conservatives. <laughs> Uh, There's one letter missing there, unfortunately. So it's a guy named Michael Regan, who worked for both Bush 43 and Obama. So don't know much about him. Uh, Also, Jim, yesterday we're talking about how the Washington Post was uh, scrambling to Pete Buttigieg's defense to talk about how, you know what, airports really are romantic. And of course, we poured cold water all over that. But we had one uh, listener comment. How did you guys miss the greatest airport romance of all time? And that's Die Hard 2. And uh, Jim, I would say two things, maybe even more about that. First of all, I'm not sure I would classify John and Holly as one of life's greatest romances. Uh, <laughs> there, was a, there were some issues in that relationship, although Die Hard 2 was probably the one where they're on the best terms. But yes, uh, obviously that uh, turned out uh, very well. They were meeting each other for Christmas. You have that anticipation. Uh, the woman you love is coming in on the plane. You're trying to stop uh, terrorists from smuggling out a... Uh, Castro-like dictator on another plane. It's a very busy day at the airport, but as long as you know you've got to wait for that incoming plane, you might as well keep yourself busy. So Die Hard 2 uh, uh, is, is definitely another good piece of Christmas fare. And if you're going to have airport romance, which airports are not, I'm still sticking with that position, Die Hard 2 is as close as you're going to get. You know, besides its importance in the pantheons of Western literature, <laughs> and and the cornerstone of what what makes us not just a people, Greg, but I think a species. The purpose of Die Hard 2 is to make every subsequent interaction you have with an airport in any capacity make you say, okay, it's not that bad. <laughs> Lost your luggage? Ah, okay. At least you didn't, you know, have a shootout with two guys there. Uh, traffic's bad. Okay, you didn't have to deal with uh, Dennis Franz. Uh, you know, uh, delayed flight, okay, at least it didn't blow up uh, and, and all of that, you know. No matter what you're having at an airport, at least you had a better flight than General Esperanza. Was- you know, Die Hard 2 is just a great perspective on life. It teaches us. <laughs> That's right. It was a short flight for General Esperanza and uh, <laughs> uh, the colonel there. But uh, yeah, I mean, there, we don't want to give away a lot because, I mean, the movie's only 30 years old. So uh, there's a lot of spoilers we... We could give away, and maybe we will at uh, one point. But I like the juxtaposition, you know, in the first Die Hard. uh, The reporter was definitely the evil one, and the cop was the the great ally. Kind of reversed, in uh, ultimately, in uh, in Die Hard 2. But I'll let you guys figure that out. All right, on to our uh, first bad martini. And Jim, lots of hacking going on. And apparently it's been going on for a while, and we're just figuring it out. Uh, First of all, over at Politico... The Energy Department and the National Nuclear Security Administration, which maintains the U.S. nuclear weapons stockpile, have evidence that hackers access their networks as part of an extensive espionage operation that has affected at least half a dozen federal agencies. They found suspicious activity in networks belonging to the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, Sandia, and Los Alamos National Laboratories in New Mexico and Washington, the Office of Secure Transportation, and the Richland Field Office of the Department of Energy. The hackers have been able to do more damage at the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission than the other agencies, uh, but the officials did not elaborate. Uh, The attack on the Department of Energy is the clearest sign yet that the hackers were able to access the networks belonging to a core part of the U.S. national security enterprise. The hackers are believed to have gained access to the federal agency's networks by compromising the software company SolarWinds, which sells IT management products to hundreds of governments and private sector clients. And then former Trump advisor Tom Bossert says, yeah, this has been going on for six to nine months and uh, could be easily used to undermine public and consumer trust and data, written communications and services. He says uh, the hackers have gained persistent access to some of our most sensitive information, Jim. And, uh, you know, we've winced at all these uh, major hacks over time, OPM a few years ago, Equifax, where so many people in many cases, even unwittingly have their sensitive data. And now, of course, U.S. national security 
uh, it makes you shudder and it makes you realize we've got more work to do to stay ahead of the game. Yeah. Now, earlier in the week when the word of this hack broke, uh, I pointed out that almost the entire top levels of the Department of Homeland Security are using acting directors. We have an acting secretary, acting chief of staff, you know, acting undersecretaries. Uh, and most of them have been in those positions really beyond the amount of time they're allowed to be there uh, under federal regulations of how long you can have somebody in an acting position. Um, and it pointed out that it did not reflect well on the Trump administration. I had one or two readers who really know this stuff. I said, look, Jim, the, the problem with this hack really comes back down to the SolarWinds Orion network management projects that, that basically these are products this is basically they sell the software they assure that the software is is safe they do work with the government to make sure that it's up to snuff and and doesn't have any you know uh, uh cracks or back doors or, or things like that and ultimately the problem is solar winds orion is there some government government oversight of this yes but in the end, you know, you could have had all the right people in a non-acting capacity at DHS. It probably wouldn't have made that much of a difference. And, you know, these people know more about this topic than I do. It, you know, if, if ultimately responsibility lies with solar winds, that's bad. On the other hand, it's all these federal agencies that are using this. And, you know, I don't know how much the Department of Energy and the people who are in charge of the nuclear stockpile can say, well, the company said the software was safe, so it's not our fault. You know, your job is to do it, even if the uh, even if your contractor uh, drops the ball and fumbles in this. Look, this is a very big deal. And I get frustrated when I hear terms like, you know, I, I've seen a couple of times people say, is this a form of, is this the cyber Pearl Harbor? Look, as far as I'm concerned, the cyber Pearl Harbor occurred back in the Office of Personnel Management Act, uh, where it is believed that hackers connected to the Chinese government basically got the personnel files on just about everyone in the federal employees, including people who handle classified information, and yes, this is the sort of stuff in their personnel files that is they don't want the world to know. Uh, it was very, very bad. And I'm kind of marvel at the fact of how much that wasn't a bigger story. But uh, Greg, it seems like a, a universal constant of these sorts of things. Most people don't spend a lot of time thinking about cybersecurity if it's not part of their job. And the only time they do start thinking about it is when there's a screw up. And once there's a screw up, it's too late. Jim, it says six to nine months. It's not hard to realize that nine months ago is when everybody started working from home, or at least a lot of people did. So do you think the major upheaval of personnel and how they did their jobs uh, was used as an opportunity? Because, you know, uh, whatever the guy's name on Saturday Night Live, Nick Burns or whatever, your company computer guy, <laughs> wasn't there in person to keep an eye on some things. It's possible, but I think the, the metaphor somebody described, like when people are saying it's not cyber Pearl Harbor, part of it's because we don't know the full extent of it yet. And it was a metaphor that I liked uh, that I read this morning where somebody said, don't think of it as like breaking into a safe. Think about finding it, finding out that somebody's had the copies of the keys to your house for like six to nine months. And they've been walking around inside your house. So you don't know if they've stolen anything. You don't know if they've uh, moved anything. You don't know if they've seen anything you didn't want them to see. But this has been going on for quite some time. And so we don't really know the damage yet. It could be very bad. Thankfully, it doesn't mean that they've used this to uh, shut down power plants or shut down, uh, you know, mess with the stock markets or any of the things you see in the cyber hacking movie kind of stuff. Most of that stuff, by the way, is conceivably possible. Um, there's an interesting question about whether, if you know, the strongest suspicion is that this is Russia. Whenever you say this, there are some bunch of people on social media who jump up, how do you know that? Uh, look, okay, I don't know this personally. I do know Russians like to do hacking stuff. There, there's, that's not, that, that in and of itself is not uh, uh, surprising. Um, and I think Russia would be more interested in knowing our secrets than actually like causing chaos in America and causing nuclear power plants to melt down or, or things like that. I think they recognize that would be a bridge too far. Um, by the way, like, I'm not going to pretend to be the world's biggest expert in cyber warfare and cybersecurity. But I will note I had a chance years and years back to attend a really interesting conference on this that had all kinds of experts, government officials, I think with a guy who was in charge of cybersecurity from Microsoft and stuff. And they pointed out that like, if it feels like this is a blurrier world without bright lines, that's one of the things that makes it so attractive for both you know, hostile groups and, and nation states. If you fire a missile at a U.S. base, you know the U.S. military is going to come back at you with everything they've got, right? That's, that's clearly an act of war. That's very clear. If you hack into a base and mess with their systems, 
it's less clear that that's an act of war. It's less clear as to what is, it's less clear who did it, and it's less clear about what the appropriate uh, uh, retaliation is. You know, if, if you mess around with their systems, are you, are, is that going to escalate it? That, that, that fog there, that lack of clarity, is what makes cyber warfare so tempting for people. And that's the world we're in. A lot of people have been sounding the alarm for this for a really long time. And I have a sneaking suspicion that for the average politician and for the average American voter, this just isn't something they worry about that often, once again, until it's too late. Well, Jim, I remember it was, gosh, 15, 16 years ago, the terrorists tried to melt down the San Gabriel (laughs) Island nuclear power plant uh, near Los Angeles and was only uh, due to the outstanding technical skills of a counterterrorism unit uh, analyst named Edgar Stiles that the the tragedy was averted. So uh, hopefully uh, the Russians are not planning or whoever it is is not planning to engage in anything like that. But it's good to know we do have the very best on it in case it does. In the end, they opened a socket. Uh, which is very important. (laughs) And remember, I I know it sounds complicated, listeners, just keep in mind, darn it, we don't have time to explain. All right. Uh, Let's talk about how to uh, get your head straight after hearing news like this, because as if we didn't need to tell you even before this story, 2020 has challenged even the most difficult times in life. And you need stress relief that goes beyond the quick fixes. And that's where Headspace comes in. Headspace is your daily dose of mindfulness in the form of guided meditations in an easy to use app. Headspace is one of the only meditation apps that is advancing the field of mindfulness and meditation through clinically validated research. So whatever the situation, Headspace really can help you feel better. Feeling overwhelmed? Headspace has a three-minute SOS meditation for you. Need some help falling asleep? Headspace has wind-down sessions that their members swear by. And for parents, Headspace even has morning meditations that you can do with your kids. Headspace's approach to mindfulness can reduce stress, improve sleep, boost focus, and increase your overall sense of well-being. Our chief of operations here at Radio America has said that Headspace has been very helpful for some of my Radio America colleagues. They uh, sleep better, their mood's better, they're more focused, uh, and that's been very helpful in a very difficult year. Uh, Headspace is backed by 25 published studies on its benefits, 600,000 five-star reviews, and more than 60 million downloads. So you deserve to feel happier, and Headspace is meditation made simple. Go to headspace.com slash martini. That's headspace.com slash martini for a free one-month trial with access to Headspace's full library of meditations for every situation. It's the best deal they're offering right now, so head over to headspace.com slash martini today. All right, Jim, let's move on to, I would say, crazy martini number one, but uh, some might say it's bad. Joe Biden has given another sit-down interview. I think this was his third since uh, election day back on November 30. He gave one to David Muir, I believe, at ABC. Uh, then he gave one to Jake Tapper. And now he's giving one to Stephen Colbert. <laughs> so you can tell that, one of uh, these things is not like the other. <laughs> so, and the issue of uh, Hunter Biden came up. And of course, uh, during the campaign, uh, the, the allegations that the New York Post uh, published uh, about a month uh, before election day, maybe even closer to election day than that. Uh, the rest of the mainstream media decided it was Russian disinformation, speaking of the Russians, and uh, no responsible person would report on such a scurrilous accusation. And of course, since then, we found out Hunter Biden has been under federal investigation for quite a long time on tax issues, possible money laundering, ties to the Chinese and other countries. And so uh, Colbert brought it up. And here's Joe Biden's explanation of where he stands on this. He's, of course, standing by Hunter. We have great confidence in our son. Uh, I am not concerned about any accusations been made against him. It's used to get to me. I think it's kind of foul play. But uh, look, it is what it is. And uh, he's a grown man. He is the smartest man I know. I mean, in pure, pure intellectual capacity. Um, and, uh, and as long as he's good, we're good. So, Jim, on the one hand, you figure, well, of course, a dad is going to give his son the benefit of the doubt. Uh, I-, I noticed his careful phrasing of how he considered Hunter the most intellectually capacitated person he's known, because when it comes to making good decisions, Hunter can't possibly be in that category. He did say he's a grown man, which is different than what the media said initially about Hunter Biden back in the day. But the idea that we should just assume after Hunter Biden's track record that all is on the up and up, especially after an ongoing federal investigation, seems to be pretty naive here. You know, Greg, I, I hear that from Biden, and I want to ask if, shockingly, Stephen Colbert did not have tough follow-up questions. But if he had, 
it would be nice to hear something like, does President-elect Biden think the FBI wants to use Hunter Biden to get to Joe Biden? I don't think that's the case. Well, that's what Biden said, though. He said right? the only reason they're going after Biden is to get to him. Well, who's the they? Like, if, he, if he's referring to they as in Republicans use, you know, Hunter Biden to, to you know, uh, harm the good name of Joe Biden, that's one thing. But I mean, does he believe that the FBI ultimately wants to investigate Joe? Does he believe that the FBI is out to get him? If so, let's say so clearly. Explain why, Mr. President-elect, why you feel that way. Uh, and then, you know, does he believe that this investigation into Hunter Biden is foul play? Does he believe there's something illegitimate about it, that this is some sort of partisan fishing trip? Now, look, we don't know how this investigation is going to play out. It is conceivably possible that the FBI or other institutions look at the IRS and people look at the tax records, look at the allegations of money laundering, look at the partners that, uh, that Hunter Biden has had and goes, yep, nope, nothing, nothing wrong here, nothing unusual, nothing, nothing you know, no crimes committed. Um, and well, we're just going to, you know, close it all up. But having assembled the, you know, detailed and lengthy timeline of Hunter Biden and his career and all of the unusual business associates he's had from China, as well as Burisma in Ukraine and, and all of these other folks um, who have been indicted on other crimes and stuff. I think conservatives don't need to beat the drum on this too much because I don't think the story is over. And I don't think the FBI is going to say, no, this all looks fine. Everything's hunky dory. Don't worry about it. I think it's very likely that they will find some. Hunter Biden does not strike me as a careful guy. He does not strike me as a criminal mastermind who's going to pull off some elaborate scheme and not leave any fingerprints. We've already seen the the, the laptop uh, from the computer store in Delaware and the email saying my dad needs uh, office keys and, and all kinds of stuff like that. Look, if there was a crime committed, I think the FBI is going to find it. And no, I don't believe that Hunter Biden is so smooth so intellectual as the president elect insists uh, that there's just, he's, they're just not going to be able to find the evidence. If the evidence is there, they're going to find it. And if they do, Hunter Biden will face criminal charges and it'll be a major embarrassment to the white house. And people legitimately ask, Oh, are you sure Mr. President elect that you never discussed Hunter Biden's clients with your son? Are you sure that this didn't have any influence on anything that, you know, his flying over to you uh, to China with you, you're sure you know, that this, this conceivably could start leading closer to the president of the United States in 2021 or 2022 or something like that. So let's let this play out. But I have a sneaking suspicion that these kind of blank, how dare you attack the good name of my son uh, responses from Joe Biden aren't going to do very good. And at some point, the president of the United States is going to have to answer questions from somebody a little more, a little tougher than Stephen Colbert. And oh, by the way, remember how he snapped at Savannah Guthrie that, you know, relentlessly anti-Biden, pro-Republican voice over at NBC News. I think there are more tough interviews for Joe Biden in the future on this subject. Exactly. And there's more information out now about Joe being involved with some of these emails, uh, suggesting that uh, you need to get Joe involved, but don't mention Joe being involved. And we kind of heard that from Tony Bobolinsky a few weeks back. And so I won't be shocked if if there is some uh, Joe Biden involvement in this investigation. But uh, we'll see where it goes uh, from here. But uh, the idea that uh, Hunter is above reproach, Jim, I think has been pretty well dispelled here over the past decade. I mean, from denying parentage to the sordid uh, situation with his brother's widow to uh, his obvious issues with drugs, the the idea that Hunter Biden would never do anything unsavory, that argument's not going to hold water. Hi, I'm Sarah Carter. On every edition of the Sarah Carter podcast, I say we're taking back the story. And that's exactly what we have to do. Whether it's the Russia hoax, the relentless attacks on President Trump pretending Antifa doesn't exist, or covering up for the repressive Chinese government, the mainstream media isn't interested in the truth. It's up to us to uncover the truth and share it with others. Please join me in taking back the story on the Sarah Carter podcast. Subscribe on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. On to our final martini, our crazy martini. And Jim, this is downright evil. Uh, So the vaccines are on their way. Pfizer vaccines are on their way. Uh, An FDA panel approved the Moderna vaccine yesterday. Uh, Needs full approval and CDC sign off and that sort of thing. But um, uh, HHS says there's almost 6 million doses of that ready to go as soon as that uh, process is done. So the vaccines are on the way. Uh, And then the question becomes the distribution. We've talked about this before. Uh, And the New York Times has a story on who should be first in line. And of course, the the things we hear constantly is frontline medical workers 
and the elderly, the people most vulnerable. But Jim, as the New York Times points out, essential workers and frontline workers actually has a pretty broad definition. For example, in Mississippi, 58% of workers there are considered frontline. And if you tack on essential, it's up to 75%. And if you look at any state in the country, the number's not lower than 66%. And so they're trying to figure out who ought to go first. And here in the New York Times, they quote a lot of different people. Many of them have very woke approaches to how this ought to work. But the one that really stands out is a guy named Harold Schmidt. He's an expert, supposedly, in ethics and health policy at the University of Pennsylvania. And here's what the Times writes. He sa- it says that Schmidt said that it's reasonable to put essential workers, that's a lot of people, remember, ahead of older adults given their risks and that they are disproportionately minorities. Quote, older populations are whiter, Dr. Schmidt said. Quote, society is structured in a way that enables them to live longer. Instead of giving additional health benefits to those who already had more of them, we can start to level the playing field a bit. Jim, uh, the, the intersectionality of politics is invading every nook and cranny. We see that with Biden's cabinet picks and the policies that he wants to advance, and that doesn't come as a huge shock, although it's really uh, unfortunate. But the idea now that, well, more old people are white, so it's time to try to cull the herd a little bit so we can have equitable balance or something in our population. This is uh, very Orwellian, and it's really ugly. Greg, my only hope is that this morning, one person after another is walking into his office, holding the New York Times, seeing his quote, and saying, what the hell is this, Schmidt? In part because, you know, by the way, Captain America fans will say, oh, someone named Schmidt who wants to elevate one ethnic group over another, over their genes. Hmm, I haven't seen that before. Anyway, um, look, you, you could make an argument that uh, I, I suspect when all is said and done regarding this virus, we're going to study the genetics of people and we're going to find certain genes are more vulnerable to this virus than others. Age clearly is a factor. Uh, viral load clearly is a factor. Um, but by, you know, men seem to be getting hit harder than women are. Um, but by and large, my suspicion is at some point we're going to look at it and we're going to say, aha, if you have these genes, you are more likely to succumb to SARS-CoV-2 than other ones. And, and it's quite possible that African-Americans or Latino Americans or certain ethnic groups will have more of these genes than others. This is not an endorsement that one ethnic group or one group of genes is better than the other. It's just an observation that this is reality. Some, you know, it's, as people who have, uh, this is not, I didn't start this sentence intending to plug hunting for horsemen, but this is one of the things that got me exploring down this road in the book. There are a small group of people who are almost immune to anthrax, or at least the amount of anthrax it takes to kill their cells is way more than for everybody else. Um, there are groups of people who are immune to malaria in a certain part of uh, Nepal and India border. You know, this is kind of a fascinating factor, which they're just certain people have different levels of resistance. So if you wanted to say, hey, based on what we're seeing, African-American groups and, and Latino groups and other groups are getting hit really, really badly when they get an infection. Thus, they would have the greatest benefit. And therefore, we think these people should be prioritized for getting the vaccine. I could at least hear that out. I, I could at least, you could at least see the logic behind that, that you're trying to save lives. It doesn't say with, well, actually, whites have had too many advantages so far, so it's time to let them die, right? That's, you know, um, the other thing I'm going to observe, Greg, I don't know about you, but the more I read about medical ethics, and I might as well like put my, that in air quotes as I say this, anytime someone has the word ethicist or ethics in their title, I brace myself to hear an argument that is enormously unethical. Yeah, they're trying to, you know, be on the cutting edge in some ways. And of course, they want to be on the cultural cutting edge as well. And that's what makes them crazy. They say stupid things like this, but then the Overton window moves and all of a sudden more people are talking about crazy stuff like this. Hey, you know what? Everyone should get vaccinated when they can. And (laughs) it sounds like two bits of good news, maybe to close out this generally bad one, is that uh, so the Pfizer vials that are being sent out apparently are supposed to have five doses in them. But it's standard in, in allocating medicine that they put, a little, they put a little extra in in case you spill some or something like that. And people who are administering the vaccine were looking at it and kind of realizing, well, actually, we probably could get like six or seven of these if we're really careful. Um, so instead of having five doses per vial, now people are saying, well, actually, we might have six or seven. And that means you can do a lot more vaccinations per shipment than you thought you could do. 
Greg, I don't know about you, but that sounds like Hanukkah to me. <laughs> um, you know, you got a certain amount. You don't think it's going to last long enough. And lo and behold, miraculously, it lasts longer than it's supposed to. Um, I, will, I will take that every single day of the week. Secondly, for anybody out there who's still doubting, who's still suspicious, maybe a buy into this idea that the, the vaccine's not safe for Trump was in some back room with a white coat and Bunsen burners and, and you know, boiling Cheetos or something like that. Uh, let me put it this way. In Los Angeles, the wealthy, famous people are calling up concierge doctors and saying, can you get me the vaccine? If I donate $25,000, would that help? Folks, rich, wealthy people want this. Therefore, you should want to get in front of them in line as much as you can. Yes. I'm not sure I'd want to be the seventh person in line with those vials if they're like, eh, can squeeze <laughs> yeah, out I don't, I don't want the dregs. <laughs> You know, maybe it's like apple cider where like the really strong stuff is at the bottom, you know. Anyway, yeah, it's good to end the week on on, on some good news, Jim, because this was a pretty bleak one with uh, hacking and Hunter and whatever Harold Schmidt's thinking. Hopefully uh, it's, he's not thinking that for too long. But uh, Jim, have a good weekend and we'll see you again on Monday. See you Monday, Greg. Jim Garrity, National Review. I'm Greg Corumbus, Radio America. Thanks for being with us today. Don't forget about uh, Headspace. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the Three Martini Lunch podcast. You can uh, leave a five-star rating and a kind review. We're very grateful for those, and they do help the podcast also. Uh, Remember, you can get us on those home devices. All you have to say is play Three Martini Lunch podcast. Have a great weekend, and we'll see you again on Monday for the next Three Martini Lunch.